Let's all stand up. In a few, we're going to have a couple of songs. In a few moments, Tracy Williams is going to lead us in the Lord's Supper. That's going to be great. But let's sing out loud. Let's sing some praise to our God. Amen. At, how's everybody doing? Still beautiful outside. It's October. Huh? Looking good. So thank you. We're going to say thank you to the Lord in a song. So here we go. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. And thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Father, for saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Let us all of one accord sing praises to Christ the Lord. Let us all unite in song and sing all day long. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Father, for saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Please reveal your will for me so I can serve you for eternity. Use my life in every way. Take hold of it today. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. We're going to sing Humble Yourself in the Sight of the Lord. Something that I've found in my time is a good thing to do. And if you find yourself on the wrong side of that, it's good to practice doing it again. Humble Yourself in the Sight of the Lord. Humble Yourself in the Sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up, and he will lift you up. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now.
Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, has anybody had any challenges this week? Raise your hand. Or maybe in the last couple weeks. All right, all right, good. It's good to see we all had some challenges. That means you're normal. Um, I'm going to talk about some challenges in my life. And don't judge me. These are first world problems, okay? They're not third world problems. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, we decided we wanted a new dishwasher. Um, my other one gave up the ghost. Um, so we're like, well, it's time to get a dishwasher. And so we went down this whole road of, you know, finding a dishwasher. Who would have known it would have been such a challenge? Um, the first thing we did is, you know, uh, obviously washing dishes by hand is a lot different than loading a dishwasher. And you realize how much you appreciate your dishwasher once it's gone. Um, and then, you know, we basically started looking, washing dishes by hand, and took about a week or a week and a half to find, okay, we're going to go with this dishwasher. There's lots of options. And um, we ordered it. It was going to be another week or so to get the dishwasher. So, you know, just washing dishes by hand, waiting for our new dishwasher. Um, they show up finally with the dishwasher to install it. And they can't get the old dishwasher out of the uh, enclosure. So they tell me, you know, uh, you're going to have to remove tile, and you're going to have to fix a valve, you need a plumber to come out, uh, and then we'll come back and try to install the new dishwasher. Uh, I said, okay, that's fine. So uh, the next day I had a plumber come out, fix some stuff, you know, but the whole time I'm taking time off work, it's in the middle of the day, hey, we'll be there between 12 and 4, you know, four-hour window, yeah. you're like, this is great for planning, you know. Um, but anyway, so we have a plumber come out, fix it, and then the next day, probably two days later, they come back out to reinstall the other one. Um, and they reinstall it. They put, I pulled the, the old one out. They put it in, turned it on, starts dumping water all over the floor. Brand new dishwasher, right? And they're like, oh, it's a manufacturer defect. Um, I'm like, well, can you take it? No, you got to call our, you know, I'm not going to say the name of the company. I was going to say the name. Um, one of the companies here in town, you got to call them, and they'll come and pick it up and then exchange it for a new one. So we decide, well, we're going to go with a different company. We just want a refund, so come get it. And then, um, you know, we're just going to, we're going to buy a different one. And so we do that, and they come out to uh, actually pick it up, but the guys that installed it left it installed, and when the guys from this company came to pick it up, they couldn't take it because it was still hooked up. So they left it there, um, and... I was getting a little frustrated, right? This is over the course of a few weeks. And so finally, um, the new company, their guys show up, and I'm like, well, they'll just uninstall the old one that doesn't work, that's brand new, take it out, put their new one in. So that's what they did. The guy came, and poor Avery was at home the whole time. He was having to deal with it on his break. And, you know, everybody else was working and stuff, and Avery's there dealing with dishwasher people. But anyways, they installed the new one that we bought uh, from a different company. And then I'm like, great, you know, uh, the guy just pulls the other one out that the other company's still going to pick up at some point. And I'm like, it's all done. Thank God. Right. Then I get a call from the new company and the guy's like, oh, uh, I installed the wrong dishwasher in your house. And uh, you actually have the upgraded model now, you know, uh, but you're going to have to pay the difference. And <laughs> oh. <laughs> or we can you can, you know, get the old one, but it's going to be a whole ordeal, you know. So anyways. First world problems, right? You know, um, and I can't say that I responded the greatest during all this whole ordeal. Um, there was a time where I told Avery, "Put the man on the phone," and I was like, "You need to take the dishwasher now. I don't want that dishwasher in my house." And he's like, "I can't touch it. I can't touch it." Um, but you know, there was times I was really frustrated, and I thought about um, you know frustrations and challenges and. You know, we're talking about Jesus today. We're talking about, um, you know, the cross. We're talking about communion and remembering Jesus. So if you'll turn over to Luke chapter 9, um, we'll kind of bring this back to a spiritual thought. Luke chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse 18. Uh, it says, once... When Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. What about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus uh, strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, 
the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. You know, the point I want to make here is that Jesus knew who, who he was. He was the Son of God. And he also knew what was ahead. He knew that the Son of Man must suffer at the hands of the chief priests and the elders and be killed uh, by them. He knew the challenges that were ahead. You know, if somebody was to tell me, hey, you're going to buy a dishwasher from this company, and then you're going to go, you have to return it and do all this stuff, and blah, blah, I probably would have made a different decision. I would have said, you know, there's probably a third company I'm going to go with, and I'm not going to go down that route, right? Jesus knew the challenges that he was going to face, and yet uh, he, he went into that full-hearted, right? He went into that knowing that, hey, uh, there could, I could make a different choice, right? The Bible says that Jesus at any point could have bailed out, called 10,000 angels at his disposal, you know, and just made a different, you know, God, let's do something else. I, I'm, not, I'm not down with this, right? But, but he didn't do that even though he knew it was going to be a difficult path ahead. And what's the point here? Well, let's keep reading. He said in verse 23, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will save it. You know, if we're going to be disciples, Jesus says we need to take up our cross. Is that an easy thing to do? It's a difficult thing to do. Um, you know, he's talking about some real challenging times that these people are going to face carrying their cross. I mean, honestly, a dishwasher problem is not a big deal, right? Uh, that's just a, that's a, a trivial thing. I just make the point that when we face challenges as, as Christians, as disciples, we need to think about Jesus. And we need to understand there's going to be challenges in our faith. There's going to be challenges to our faith when we carry the cross. And you have to realize that up front, and then when it comes, not bail out at the time. Right? And think about your response at the time. Jesus at the time, it was hard, but he went through it. He went to the cross. He died for you and I. And he did it the way that God had intended. If we're going to carry our cross, we're going to have those same challenges as disciples. There's going to be times where you're going to be challenged in your faith. And you're going to have to make a decision to push through. You know? You can either bail out now and say, I'm not going to do it. Or you can carry your cross and be ready for the challenges when they come. So as we take the, the bread and the cup uh, this afternoon, think about Jesus. Think about your future. Think about the challenges ahead. And let's make a decision to follow in Jesus' footsteps. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, God, I just thank you so much for this time to um, reflect on the scriptures. I thank you so much for the example of Jesus, God. Every time we look at Jesus, God, we're inspired, we're convicted, and we're motivated, God, to do better. I thank you so much for our Lord. I thank you so much for his sacrifice and for the bread and cup that we're able to take to remember him, Father. And God, to think about the challenges that lay ahead for us, God. Help us to have the same strength and compassion and will, Father, uh, to, to face those challenges head on like Jesus did in his life. God, thank you so much for all this. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, you are for us and not against us. You are for us and not against us. And when we're in the midst of challenge, just as Tracy was sharing with us and leading us, 
we're in the midst of, when we're in the midst of challenge, we don't feel that at times. We don't feel that you're with us when we are disappointed or frustrated or in need or in crisis. But that's exactly what Satan wants us to think, that you're not there, that you're not all that you say that you are. Father, you are the Almighty, and your way, your plan, your design for our life is far beyond our understanding. Help us to get that. Help us to lock into that and get to a point, a place where we trust you, where we trust you, where we surrender to you. Daily determines destiny. What we do every day will determine where we go, where we land. And I pray, God, that spiritually we would see that if we surrender to you, that we practice that on a daily basis, Father, you will faithfully lead, lead us to where you want us to go. And it may not look like what we want it to be, but Father, you have a great plan that we can trust. You are perfect. Your will is perfect. Your design is perfect. Thank you, Father, for all that you are, all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. And the church said, amen, amen. amen. Let's thank our brother Tracy Williams. Great job. Great job. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. What time is it? It's time to fellowship, right? It's time to fellowship. It's time to fellowship. So... Let's take an extended fellowship break, and I'll warn you right now to help you spiritually. I'm going to be talking about chocolate in my sermon. We're talking about chocolate. I'm warning you now. Let's take a break. All right, everybody, if you'll stand with me, we're going to sing another song. I feel good. Well, I feel good. Good, good. Oh, I feel good, oh yes, my Lord, because there's something about the spirit of my Jesus that makes me feel good, 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 good. Well, I feel love, love, love. Well, I feel love, oh yes, my Lord, because there's something about the spirit of my Jesus that makes me feel love, 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 love. Well, I feel peace, peace, peace. Well, I feel peace, oh yes, my Lord. Because there's something about the spirit of a Jesus that makes me feel peace, 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 peace. Well, I've got joy, joy, joy. Well, I've got joy, oh yes, my Lord. Because there's something about the spirit of my Jesus that makes me feel joy, 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 joy. Because there's something about the spirit of my Jesus that makes me feel peace, 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 peace. Because there's something about the spirit of my Jesus that makes me feel love, 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 love. Because there's something about the spirit of my Jesus that makes me feel good, 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 good. Amen. Please have a seat. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, song leaders. Great job, great job. All right, I'm going to have Scott Leader stand up. And he's going to lead us in a word of prayer. We're going to be talking about, today, we're going to be talking about loving others, loving others, loving others, and how important that is to our great God.
Amen. Thank you, Scott. All right, Ammo, give me that first pick. All right, there you go. I told you. Kind of a warning. I told you. I told you. We're going to be talking about chocolate for a few moments to help us grow spiritually. This is the infamous Whitman Sampler. Whitman Sampler. Very, very famous. It's been around a long time. And it is uh, a gift of chocolate given as an encouragement. Let's see another. Let's see another. Seize candy, where all good Christians should go, right? Right? If we've learned anything over the last six years of being together, that's where all good Christians could go. Seize candy. Uh, that's a, a very nice assortment there. Who likes um, uh, soft centers? Who likes soft centers when you're eating that kind of chocolate? Yeah? Yeah? Nuggets and chews? Nuggets and chews? There you go. There you go. Okay. Okay. Very good. Let's see another. Let's see another. There you go. Hawaiian host, Hawaiian host, Rob, Hawaiian host. Chocolate-covered macadamia nuts. Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? No factions, no division. Milk chocolate, dark chocolate. Okay, so when I was growing up, a box of Seas candy and a box of Hawaiian host chocolate-covered macadamia nuts. I'm half Japanese, half Hawaiian. Uh, two-tiered, two-tiered boxes. Two-tiered boxes of Seas candy and Hawaiian host was under our Christmas tree every year, every year. And uh, you, you won't find that on Ancestry.com. There you go. Okay, show me another. Show me another. Godiva chocolate. Godiva chocolate. This is uh, a higher-end chocolate. Not the highest end, but this is a higher-end chocolate. And uh, uh, the tastes in there, there's some liqueurs in there. Uh, there's all sorts of, of delicious taste treats. Uh, that's a higher-end chocolate that you'll find in finer stores, and Godiva actually has some of their own stores as well. Now, why am I showing you this chocolate, especially this box right here? Because, that's right, uh, Tracy said there'd be challenges, right? Dishwasher chocolate, you just got to get it all in your head. Okay, so uh, when I first started dating my beautiful wife many decades ago. Uh, one of the things that I really loved was that, was Godiva chocolate. And, uh, and so I would go to higher end stores just to get it uh, at the time. It wasn't as readily available. And so to encourage my wife, some would say woo. Everybody say woo. Woo, to woo my wife, my beautiful wife, I would bring her a Godiva chocolate. And I thought, I'm the man. I'm the man. I'm not giving her a Whitman sampler. I'm giving her a Godiva. Godiva chocolate. And I thought, man, I am the man. I am the man. Well, after a couple, two or three or four dates, uh, my wife-to-be, we weren't married yet, she said, you know, just to be honest with you, I don't even like chocolate. <laughs> oh! Shot through the heart! And you're to blame! I mean, it was bad. But see, I thought, I thought that that's what she wanted. I thought that that's what she loved. Most people, not all people, really like chocolate, especially finer chocolates. And so I would bring that to my wife, but then later found out that that's not what she really wants or likes. <laughs> that is rough. That is rough. But see, I think our problem spiritually is that we do things uh, earnestly, sincerely, that we think God loves. And we've done it for a long time. And we try really hard in doing these things that we think God loves. And, and all the while, that's not really what God wants. Are you following me? Yeah. That's not what God really loves. That's not really what inspires him. Now, going back to V's comment here in the front, there's no way I would talk about chocolate and not provide for you chocolate later on. 
but there's no way I'm handing out these seize candy lollipops because you'll never listen to the sermon and my job will be in jeopardy. So we're going to jump right into the text. Amen. He wants you to want him. Part five, part five. Point number one, loving him is carefully following his commands. This is Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 6, ta talking about Israel, God's relationship with Israel at the time. And he says in verse 1, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow what? All his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Sounds great, doesn't it? Look at verse 3. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and, and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. Verse 5. Your basket and your kneading uh, trough will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. That sounds like a lot of what? A lot of blessing. And so this is the charge that God is giving uh, Israel at the time. Now, look at the commentary. The idea behind choice, that is following God, following his, his commands, is that God was determined to reveal himself to the world through Israel at the time. Today, God is trying to reveal himself through who? Us. 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 Now, let's continue. He would do this either by making them so blessed that the world would, only know, only, would know only God could have blessed them, or by making them so cursed that only God could have cursed them and caused them to still survive. Which, which end of that spectrum would you like to be on? The blessed side, right? The blessed end of that spectrum. I'd love to be on that end. And so when you're looking at obeying his commands, I I'm giving you this example because the direction is to obey his commands. But we can't look at it like, well, it just seems like a discipline. It just seems like laws. It just seems like rules. It just seems like I need to do this uh, just because you said so. And there's no real purpose to it. But there was a lot of purpose to it from when it's first brought up in the scriptures. God is trying to reveal himself to the world right now through us, through the person sitting in your row, the person sitting behind you, and through you when you obey his commands. When you obey his commands. Amen? All right, point number two. Loving him is having and keeping his commands. We're looking at John 14, verses 15 through 21. This is when Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. Verse 15. If you love me, you'll what? If you love me. If you love me, this is what you're going to give me. Your obedience to my commands. You're not going to give me something that I don't want. You're going to give me what I desire. That is keeping my commands. And this is Jesus speaking, right? And he says directly, if you'll love me, this is what you'll do. You'll obey my commands. Simple, profound. Verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. That is the Holy Spirit. Lowercase a here on advocate later in the passage. Capital A referring to advocate, referring to Again, the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and he will be in you. There's a lot in just that one little sentence. You know him, he lives with you, and will be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you will also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my what? Commands and keeps them. 
is the one who loves me. Notice the distinction. You can have the commands and not keep them. You can have the commands and not live them. You can know what they are and not do it. And God is saying specifically, this is what I want from you. This is love to me. This is my, if you will, love language. Keeping my commands. So specific. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. When people look outside of the Reno Church that are part of this organization, and they're watching how the church has progressed uh, over the last five, six years, and all the miracles that have happened here, when they're watching it, they see God demonstrating God. When BJ and I go to conferences and we're talking to people and, and they're asking about the church and different things that have happened, not that we're perfect at all, but when they're asking, well, how did this happen? How did that happen? There are many times when all we say is God just did it. God just made it happen. What was your, what was your campaign? What was your approach? What was your program? Uh, I didn't have one. We didn't have one other than being in a lot of prayer and doing everything we possibly could do as leaders in leadership and as the membership to follow and obey his commands. That's all we've really done. Uh, I was talking to some brothers in different parts of the country uh, in ministry and outside of the ministry, and I told them uh, this, I had a really emotional um, middle of the night prayer uh, earlier this week and um, it was about two three in the morning and I was praying and and uh, it, you know, it was just a great deep time but near the middle of it where it got really emotional was when I, I always say that I don't like hype I don't like hype in, in uh, my approach to ministry I, I don't do it I've, I've seen a lot of it in big churches of thousands of people that we, BJ and I were on staff in, and there was a lot of hype. And I kept using that word, I don't like hype. I don't like hype. But then what hit me in this prayer time was, hype is manipulation. That's really what I meant. But I didn't really get that's what I meant. I knew, I knew kind of, but not really. But when I was in prayer, the Spirit led me to that. When you're saying that, what you mean is manipulation. And I just was in tears because... I've, as I thought about it, I thought, this is how I want to lead people in earnest and in the, the closest to period of heart I can. I, I don't want to manipulate you to follow God. I want you to see a greater God and experience that God. In, in, in seeing and knowing, experiencing God is seeing and knowing Him. And when you do that, You'll do what God wants you to do because you're motivated and inspired. This is a human divine relationship, right? And it's, as we've been talking about for the last few years, it is referred to as a marriage in the scriptures, right? If, if I can help us better see who we're married to and the fullness, the fullness uh, of the bridegroom, as we are the bride. If I can better help you better understand that, then I don't have to manipulate you. I don't have to twist your arm. And so I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it done to me. And I don't like it, I don't like to see it done in churches. And so that's why I don't hype things. But when I heard it from the Spirit as I was praying in the middle of the night, the tears just filled my face because... I feel like what we have been doing is aiming toward, and not that we do it perfectly, not that I'm perfect or we're perfect, but what we have been doing is trying to lay out, this is who a greater God is. This is what he looks like. This, this is how you can see him, and this is how you can know him. And I was so grateful that God led me, led my wife, has led us, us and as a church to be in that place 
where we are earnestly seeking God and experiencing a greater God. Are you following me? Okay. And so in saying that, in saying that, when it comes to keeping his commands, you can have them and not keep them. Keeping them means you're obeying those commands, right? And that's a clear, powerful distinction. Look at the commentary. Please consider these two scriptures uh, in having and keeping his commands. Deuteronomy 11, verse 18. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. That's a keeping, right? Proverbs 3, 3. Let love and faithfulness never leave you and bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your what? Of your heart. I want us to live out our faith from our heart. I want us to live out our faith from our heart. We've been doing, my wife and I have been doing these home improvement projects around our house, um, and we've been working together. And so working together as in doing a lot of labor at the house and making things happen. And it's all coming together. But just laboring together, lifting things, pulling things, uh, setting things uh, in place, all the stuff that we've been doing, working together brings us closer. Because we're laboring together. And it's, it's a uniting. It's a uniting and I love that. And when we work together in this relationship, like all the challenges, even dishwashers, when you're laboring through that with God, I'm challenged by this. This makes me struggle. But I want to labor through this with you. The relationship becomes closer. We are having and keeping his commands. Now, if you would, look on uh, the back of your outline. And what I do here, and I've been doing this for a, quite a long time, is I'll include a devotional uh, on the back of every one of these bulletins um, that ties into the subject that I'm preaching on to further your own personal study. Uh, and the reason why I do it is so that you can grow, that you can mature, that we can mature, more fully and more deeply, and you're always hearing from different voices, I don't write these intentionally. I don't write them because I want you to hear from different voices and different angles. Now, the title of the article is, Why Do Christians Struggle to Love? But look at, uh, look at the point where it says it's supposed to be hard. Talking about loving each other. Now look at this. It says, according to the New Testament, learning to walk in the obedience of faith looks like the following. Denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following where Jesus leads. That's Matthew. Uh, putting to death what is, what is earthly in us. Not letting sin reign in our moral bodies to make us uh, obey its passions. Dying every day to sin, personal preferences, and even our own Christian freedoms out of love for Jesus, our brothers and sisters in the faith, and unbelievers. And it goes on and on and on. Everything in that really helps us. These are practicals in how to love God and love each other better. You know, sometimes you are the dishwasher in somebody else's life. <laughs> Let that sink in for a second. Let it sink in. Sometimes you are the dishwasher in somebody else's life. And I don't say that to down us. But sometimes we are. Sometimes we are, right? And it requires the Spirit to help us love each other to that level. And I'm not just talking about the perseverance of patience. I am talking about having a heavenly perspective, a heavenly goal for everyone in our life, whether they're Christians or not. Right? That's what Christians do. I'm going to love you because I want to see you get to heaven. You, we're not loving other people just for the sake of loving them and being kind. We're loving them with purpose, a heavenly purpose, a spiritual purpose. We deny ourselves to help others see, a, experience a greater God. 
That's what it's there for. But we have to make sure we have that on straight. Because if we don't, and we don't realize that only the Spirit, only God, can help us love each other well. To the point where that heavenly focus, that heavenly ambition, if you will, comes to the surface, only God can give us that. We can't do that on our own. It only comes from the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's bring this on home, brother. Let's bring it on home. Point number three. Loving him is you hanging on to his two greatest commands. Matthew 22 and John 13. Verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest command in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And we know that, right? We know it. We, we have it. We're, we, we need to keep it, but we have it. But look at verse 38. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, verse 39, is like it. Love your neighbor as who? As yourself. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes. That's right. That's right. You want to go to heaven. As a Christian, you want to be there. You want to be right with God now. You want to be right with God then. To love your neighbor as yourself is to want the same thing for others. It's to want the same thing for others in your life. And so you are praying for them. You are praying for them. You are serving them. You're looking for ways to inspire them. You're looking for ways to serve them, encourage them, and build them up. Now, look at the next scripture. Verse 40. All the law and the prophets hang on what? These two commandments. So you take all the Old Testament law, all 360 plus laws that there were at the time, right? And Jesus says all of those laws, he says it right there, all of those laws hang on these two commandments. Love God and love others. Love God and love others. With what kind of love? A love that has a heavenly purpose, a love that has a heavenly focus. That means you've got to go a lot deeper than just being kind. Look at verse 33. Uh, and this is uh, from John 13. My children, I will be with you only a little, little, little longer. He's getting ready to leave. This is Jesus speaking. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. Verse 34. A new command I give you. What is it? Love one another. Love one another. And then he says, how? As what? That's right. Because I have loved you, Jesus is saying. So that sacrificial agape love is how we're called to love others. We sacrifice for ourselves, right? Already. When we want something, we want to see something happen, we sacrifice. We know what that means. And God wants us to do that for others. He says he wants you to love others as you love yourself. So, just in the wording, he's saying love yourself. Love yourself. Love yourself well. And then love others just as well, if not better. Don't love them less. Love them more. Just And look at how you are with yourself be that way with others. Are you following me? Okay. So he narrows all this. So all, all of those scriptures in the Old Testament where it's, where it's saying, obey my commands, obey, obey my commands. You get to the New Testament and he said, here's the only two you really need to follow. <laughs> this is it. I boiled down 360 plus down to two. I have simplified this as much as I possibly can. In so many ways. And he just follows these two commands. And he says to love God with all your heart and love one another as I have loved you. Then he says, so you must, you have to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Again, this is once again God saying he wants to reveal himself. 
He wants to reveal himself through his people, through us. And these are the only two commands that if you grab onto these, you'll do well spiritually. And honestly, I feel that if you grab onto these, you'll do well spiritually. And as you work at your life, work at yourself, you'll do much better emotionally. And I have a lot of experience in that area. A lot. And a lot of training. And I see people do much better emotionally when they are pursuing God spiritually. Because they're in a place where they're ready to be molded and shaped into who God truly wants them to be. Look at the commentary. Love is more than simply warm feelings. Love reveals itself in action. How can we love others as Jesus loves us? By helping when we are too busy, by giving sacrificially, by devoting energy to others' welfare rather than our own, by absorbing hurts from others rather than fighting back. That's a tough one. Or seeking revenge. That's from the Life Application Study Bible. And so when you hear scriptures that say, love others, love others, love others, it isn't just being kind, although that's super important. How many of you talk to your neighbors? How many of you talk to your neighbors? The places where you go on a regular basis, uh, the Starbucks or or the coffee house, or the restaurant, or uh, whatever, wherever you go, when it has to do with commerce. How many of you have a connection with the people that you see on a regular basis, like the clerks and, and uh, the managers and so forth? Okay, that's great. I mean, that, that's an awesome thing. And you want to do that. I do that. And I've done it for a long time. And, and I love all the free stuff that I get from it, that's great. But that's not why I do it. It's because when I see somebody working, I think of when I had those same positions, uh, being in uh, customer service or in, in any kind of service-oriented position. And so I always try to encourage those people because they're working super hard, right? Okay, being kind to all those people is great. Start praying for some of those people. You know, when you go to, a, a, again, a certain coffee house or a restaurant or whatever, and you see other customers like you, regulars, right? They call them regulars. You start praying for those people. Praying for those people. When they tell you what's going on in their life, their hurts, wounds, and scars, and challenges, their dishwashers, when they're talking about that stuff, you've got to pray for them. You've got to pray for them. And then when you see them again, tell them, I'm praying for you. And watch their response. Watch their response. That's you demonstrating God, and that's God demonstrating God in your life and how you are. We want, to, we want to love God in the way that God wants to be loved. In your marriages, isn't that what you want? Don't you want your spouse to love you the way that you want to be loved? Uh, in your relationships, you know, if, if, you're, if, if you're a lot younger, it, 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 with your friendships, don't you want your friends, you know, teens, 20-somethings, don't you want your friends to love you the way that you want to be loved? To recognize you? To be there for you? Isn't that what you want? Then you want to take what you have, all the skills that God's given you to love others, and sharpen those skills until your last breath on earth. How can I do this better? How can I do this more effectively? What can I do? What can I do and how can I do it? Let, let me give you an example. Uh, a friend of mine sent me and some other brothers. He, he's in the Midwest. He used to be in my ministry, our ministry, when we were in uh, a coastal ministry. And uh, he sent a text, because he lives in the Midwest now, and he said, um, I miss, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I live where I live now because he moved out there. But he said, I miss this about the summer in Southern California. And he listed a number of things. I miss In-N-Out Burger. I miss miniature golf. I miss going to the movies. I miss uh, Chinese food and Mexican food. 
I miss uh, San Luis Obispo, I miss Santa Barbara, I miss Morro Bay. And he went on this long kind of spiel, right? And so I, I looked at the text, I looked at the text, and I thought, okay, let me take this text and figure out how I can take what he said and encourage him. So what I did was, I put together this encouragement packet. And in the encouragement packet were postcards from every place that he mentioned. I, I, I worked my eBay magic and I got brand new postcards from every one of the places that he mentioned. Then I got an In-N-Out burger uh, gift card and then I got a, I, I looked up the city where he lives and I looked up what's the closest theater to his house and, and got a gift card for that theater. Um, and then, uh, then he talked about, I, I, he used to love listening to the Beach Boys, Endless Summer. And um, so I got a sealed copy of an eight track tape of the Beach Boys, Endless Summer, and I put it in this encouragement packet. Then I put red vines, licorice, you know, what you eat, what you eat at, the, at the theater, and uh, both plain and peanut M&Ms. And then I, and then mailed it out in two packages, and he should get it Tuesday. Wow. Now, and he's a brother. And he was a member in one of our ministries, and he went through some struggles a few years ago, and, um, and I heard about it, so I reached out to him, and he was shocked that as someone who's not in my immediate ministry anymore, that I would minister to him. And I said, bro, it would be weird to me if I didn't. It'd be weird to me if I didn't. So think about your skill in loving others. What are you good at? I just talked about encouragement, but what are you good at? And especially, whatever skills you have, you want to cover them with prayer. You want to, you want to do this work, whatever it is, however you, you know, texting, emails, TikTok, Facebook, whatever it is. However you love others, gifts, uh, words of encouragement, whatever it is, but you want to cover it with prayer. And you want to be praying for people. And if they're not, if they're not right with God, if they don't have salvation, you want to be praying for their salvation. That's how you love other people. That's how you love others. It's not just being nice. It's going further and further. And if you spend your time, the time of your life sharpening your skills in how you love others, then you're fulfilling the second greatest command. There's only two. <laughs> There's only two. 365, 360, narrow down to two. Man, that's like an open book test, right? I know the answer. It's the two. That's it. And when we do that, great and powerful things happen. Let's all stand. So, I talked about loving my wife through chocolate. Right? And I know you're thinking, bro, do you have any leftovers? No, stay focused, stay focused. I'm trying to preach and teach here. Okay, so what, di what, what does she love? What, what did she love? This right here. Aww. Yellow roses. Yellow roses. So when I found that out, and, and we got married on our honeymoon, it was in Orange County, where I'm from. So we, got, so we honeymooned in this old hotel that, that's closed now, but it's called the Hotel Laguna, and it's an old hotel that was there a long time ago, but it's right on the main beach. And so I put yellow roses all over the room the, the morning of the wedding to make sure that it was all in place when we got there so that she'd be encouraged. This was loving someone in the way that they wanted to be loved. God wants you to love him by obeying his commands. There's really only two. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, help us to learn to love others better. Speak to us, Spirit, in greater and greater ways that we would know you and see you, that you can be revealed through us. That's the whole plan. That's the whole design. Help us to do that well. Lord, we love you and we thank you so very much. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 You're dismissed. Have a great rest of your Sunday. If you want some chocolate, they're up here in this box.